So, this is a good group today, and each of you somehow picked this session. I don't know why, but probably you have different kinds of uh, things that you're interested in. Um, I've got way too many slides, so I'm going to go through some of them very fast. Uh, and maybe if we could hold out to the end for questions, that might be the best way to do that. What I'm going to go over. What I'm going to go through is the, uh, the, the beginnings of the historic preservation movement and the origins of the I, IHPC, Indianapolis Historic Preservation Commission, some basic principles of preservation and how it's practiced by local government, uh, just who the IHPC is and how we operate. And then I have a couple of case studies that depict and, and show the benefits and the results of having historic preservation protection on the local level. Um, just generally, historic preservation in the United States didn't really take off until the mid-60s. And that's when the National Historic Preservation Act was passed, the National Register of Historic Places was begun, uh, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, which all of a sudden, some yeah, federal money yeah. starts getting funneled to local communities to do historic preservation. Uh, and each state created a state historic preservation office. So the program really took off then. And then in 78, another pivotal point was when a, a Supreme Court decision uh, decided that historic preservation was, in fact, a constitutional thing for local governments to be undertaken. So here in Indianapolis, uh, kind of a short summary of how things got going. In the late 50s, the biggest historic preservation issue was the Riley House. Everybody knew the Riley House was important for the store. And the neighborhood around it had deteriorated to the point that everybody thought it had no value. And so at that time, the city, this is before Unica, created something called Lockerbie Fair. And it was a plan to do something around, and it was all focused on saving the Riley House. Um, and I'll come to that in a minute. Then by 60, but nothing really happened with that. Uh, 60 Historic Landmarks Foundation was formed. Historic Landmarks Foundation is now called Indiana Landmarks. They're a private, not-for-profit, statewide organization. People get the Indianapolis Preservation Commission and landmarks confused all the time. We're government. They are private, not-for-profit. It happens to be the biggest, best-funded one in the whole country. And you think, Indiana? How's that? Well, that's because Eli Lilly was a preservationist, and when he died, he left a bunch of money to create this. But in the 60s then, the community started to wake up to what they were losing. This is the classic example, the old Marion County Courthouse coming down for the city county building. And that was 59-60. Uh, and now, ironically, the city county building is over 50 years old and potentially eligible for listing on the National Register as a mid-century modern international style building with a following of people who are who love it. And I've grown to appreciate it, but working there all these years, it's hard to sometimes separate architecture and a building from the function. Anyway, the community also saw neighborhoods coming down. The whole neighborhood came down for uh, Riley Tower. There were eventually supposed to be 10 of these towers around. Only a couple of them got built. So in 67, the state legislature created a statute that created the <coughs> Preservation Commission. Those are the seven original commission members. Uh, this is, again, pre-UNIGOV. Um, that's just a list of all the powers and, and, and responsibilities of the Preservation Commission under the law. The interesting one is that in 67, it also included eminent domain. 
it never got exercised and it get, got taken away at some point, which I think is good. I would not want that over my head and having that kind of power. Back to Locker Be Fair. So the beginnings of preservation in Marion County. Um, remember what else was going on in 58? Disneyland. In that Locker Be Fair plan, they actually have this plan. It was unabashedly aimed at creating a Disneyland kind of thing around uh, Riley House. If it had been implemented, this is what would have happened. I mean, preservationists today look back and think, this is the scariest thing in the world. Riley House, this was all going to be torn down along New York Street and fake commercial buildings, three-quarter scale kind of fake commercial buildings were going to go on there to create a a um, Main Street. That was all coming out for parking, all of that coming out for a playground, parking. They weren't even keeping all the stuff in, in there. But it was all aimed at one building. Well, in 67, things were pretty dismal in Lockerbie Square. So the community didn't really see much value to it. So the first years, from 67 to 74, the commission operated with no staff at all. They only had the one district, Lockerbie Square. In the middle of that time, around 71, the Meridian Street Preservation Commission was established. I'm not going to talk a lot about it tonight, because, or today, because I'm focusing on the Indianapolis Preservation Commission. But that's a separate commission. The IHPC has no nothing to do with that. Uh, they have no staff, um, and they can't grow, and they can't designate anything else. Whereas the Indianapolis Preservation Commission, that, their statute is for all of Marion County. That's the way it looked during that time. Um, that Lockerbie Fair plan was the only thing on the books, but nothing really was happening much. Unigov got established in 7071. In 73, the first new house in Center Township in a very long time got built uh, in Lockerbie Square. In 74, there was a proposal by the, uh, what's it called, Gypsy, to, uh, that the city really ought to have some staff for this operation. And, uh, and so in 75, we started, the staff was established. So from 75 to 79, they added one district on their side, five individual properties. It's a pretty old, high profile ones. In the 80s, uh, five districts were added, one was expanded, and I came here in 84. <laughs> so this is my era that we started. Uh, Another thing that happened early in the 80s was the state statute got amended. So the size of the commission went from seven members to nine. Um, and also, it gave the commission the authority to have a hearing officer and to allow its staff to make some approvals. Up to that time, the commission had to approve everything, every little thing. Um, in the 90s, we added five districts, and I'm going to come to conservation district and come back to that. But it was during the 90s that we created this conservation district, which is a little twist on the historic district. Uh, again, in the mid-90s, the statute was amended again, this time to allow the Preservation Commission to act as the Board of Zoning Appeals to act as the Metropolitan Development Commission's hearing examiner for rezonings. So we are a one-stop shop, and that was the whole purpose. The administration at the time wanted to create those kinds of things. Uh, we're a one-stop shop for your zoning issues in historic districts. So from 2000 to 2009, we added four districts and expanded Chatham Arch to include all of Massachusetts Avenue. 
and the state statute was amended again um, to require four of the members to be appointed by the city council. Prior to that, they were all appointed by the mayor. Then uh, from 2010 to the present, we've added one district, <coughs> Monument Circle District. Um, <coughs> this one, I would have predicted would be a very difficult one uh, with a lot of opposition because there's no indigenous neighborhood group to be working with and, and to be pushing it. And you have people with huge economic interests at stake. Turns out not a single opposition was raised. So I was wrong on that one. I kind of think this is completely anecdotal or just my guessing. <coughs> I think, and I kind of found out people coming to me, I think people thought this area was already protected. I don't know how many times people would say, but is it already protected all around the circle area? No, not. So today, we're working with two neighborhood groups uh, who are interested in designating these two areas, very different areas both fascinating in their own way. Uh, Flanner House Homes is just north of Christmas Attics. They are small 1950s ranch houses. Uh, they're on the National Register of Historic Places, more for the social history of kind of self-help. I could do a whole session on this one, because it's fascinating, but uh, it's a self-help sort of thing where, where people worked on their own houses and that sort of thing. Uh, and it's fascinating that there are still people living there who are the original people who worked in the houses. And a lot of children who stayed in the houses are still there. <coughs> and they've had a few threats in the last few years, and so they're thinking uh, that they need some protection. Washington Park is a part of the Moody and Kessler neighborhood that also is on the National Register. But there's a lot of concern up in the Marine Kessler area about development, tearing down houses and building new houses and that sort of thing. And so there's a group of people seeking that. Both of those areas right now are in the process of seeking local support. Um, that's not uh, this just shows, this is dramatic. This is the number of buildings under our jurisdiction as time goes by, I mean, obviously you can see. This was when we designated Irvington. Irvington, like double, almost, the number of properties. And I see it from the standpoint of workload. So why is the city even involved in historic preservation? I mean, you've got private groups that are. Um, local government has gotten into the business of historic preservation because they see it as a public benefit. And when I'm done with this, I hope you also will at least understand what I'm talking about. Um, it serves public purposes, and the Supreme Court has uh, upheld that. And it provides a lot of rewards for the community. Um, I've talked about National Register, I mentioned it. The thing with the National Register is it doesn't protect it. It does not protect buildings from being torn down or whatever. The only thing it protects is that you can't use federal money to do something. But if you own a property, you can do whatever you want to. So here's examples of three fabulous buildings that no longer exist. They were on the National Register, but they're gone because they had no local protection. A, a local per preservation commission is really the only way to have real protection. Um, I've already talked about this. A lot of people, you know, think that, you know, they're, you're taking away their rights and everything, but that's already been uh, adjudicated through the courts. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip some of this stuff because we don't have a whole lot of time. But I do want to get to some other stuff. This is kind of interesting. You know, people wonder, like, well, what's historic? And I get the, a phone call a lot of times. Is my property historic? Well, I mean, what do you mean? What people usually mean is, is it on some kind of official list? 
because there are lists. There's, there's local districts. There's national register lists. There are surveys that indicate things are eligible. Um, there's state lists. Then there's all those buildings out there that have just been there, and they're just cool old buildings that are you remember as a child and driving all by them. That maybe it's not on a list. That's historic too. But when you talk about having some kind of either designation or recognition of it, this is kind of what Marion County looks like. But that's all that's actually protected. So who are we, the Preservation Commission? There's nine members. Um, and they, I, I say they, they represent community. Now, some people think that a Preservation Commission is filled with representatives from the different historic neighborhoods. We only are required by law to have one person who's from one of these historic districts. We actually have maybe <coughs> five or six now. But to me, it's very important that a preservation community, commission represent the whole community because we're not in it just for the benefit of the people who live in those historic districts. That's why the Supreme Court founded the Constitution. We're in it to protect those areas for everybody in the community. We are part of government. A lot, I said earlier, a lot of people think that we're uh, a historical society or something like that. Um, we are housed in the Department of Metropolitan Development and we function as one of their divisions. Um, we're a fairly small staff, five of us. Now, I want to go back to 1995. Up to that point, the Preservation Commission was a Preservation Commission. Did the kind of things that all Preservation Commissions across the country do. They adopt plans and they grant certificates of appropriateness. So they review and approve changes that occur in the district. In 95, they also became the Board of Zoning Appeals and the Metropolitan Development Commission Hearing Exam. I think we might be the only preservation commission in the country that does this. I used to say we're one of the few, but I've not found one that does. So it may be very unique. So all of a sudden, we're thrust into the zoning world. Up until that time, if you wanted to rezone your property or you needed a variance because you want to build closer to the property line or taller than what's allowed or something like that, um, you would have to come to us and get a certificate of appropriateness for us saying it's, it's appropriate to do that. Then you went to the Board of Zoning Appeals or the MDC to actually get the variance and get the use. Now you come to us and we do the whole thing. Just a word about Indy Rezone. Does everybody here know what I'm talking about? There is a session going on, I think, today about Indy Rezone. This is a complete rewrite of the zoning ordinance for Marion County. Um, it just recently passed completely. So, it, we, and it's going to go into effect April first. So, only the only thing I'm going to hit on here are two effects on historic districts, and historic preservation. One is that in the zoning ordinance there is a classification called this historic preservation district. This map, these are all zoning districts, you know, your residential and your commercial and your industrial and all that. That red one is, is the only one that's called historic preservation district. The state statute that creates a preservation commission allows it to also, at that time, pass an ordinance specific to that neighborhood. It has only done it once, and that was in Lockerbie Square. In all the other districts, it's not been done. It's just, it doesn't change the zoning at all when it becomes a historic district. Our design review kind of overlays the zoning. But Lockerbie Square is different. And in 67, that statute was created, and it was based on Lockerbie Fair. So it was a ridiculous ordinance. It taught, it set up, it, it, its standards and everything assumed that all those houses were going to be torn down, and there were going to be trolley cars, and there were going to be a 
everything else going on in there. And so, but nobody ever changed. So we have rewritten that so that now that zoning ordinance basically ties to the adopted preservation plan with the zoning recommendations that are in it. Everywhere else, again, you're, you're ruled by the same rule, whatever zoning you, you've always had, but they've rewritten some of the rules in those, and basically it's going to exempt, in our historic districts, some of those development standards like setbacks and heights and lot coverage so that we can approve things without you, the property owner, having to go get variances. If the commission looks at it and says it's appropriate. In these older neighborhoods, the houses were built closer to Canada. But the zoning standards sometimes require further apart, which might not be appropriate. So what happens is you want to build a house, it, you want it to be this far from the property line instead of that far, but you have to pay like $500 or $1,000 to get a variance to put it where it's supposed to go. Well, once Indy Rezone gets into place, that's not going to happen so often. That's a good thing. I just want to point a couple of point out a couple of things that are sort of counterintuitive to some people. People generally think, what's the goal of historic preservation protection? It's to stop development, hold things in place, keep things frozen in time. And I argue that that's not at all the case. There's really nothing about what we do that's like that. In fact, sometimes we're criticized by some folks who do believe that that's what should happen. But we expect there to be change. The buildings in all those districts, they're not going to be preserved because we say you can't change it. They're going to be preserved because they have value to people in the future, and they work for people's lives, and people want to and can live in them. They have to change in order for that to happen. So we know there's going to be change. We expect there to be change. What we're doing is managing the change. And the important thing in our mission statement is that we're doing this for all present and future citizens of Marion County not just the property owners that are there now. I want those neighborhoods there when my daughter someday, I hope, decides to move back to Indianapolis. <laughs> so, you know, it's for everybody. <clears throat> How do we make historic districts? All right. The state statute is very simple. It's a very simple process. Basically, three steps. One is it requires the, the commission pr prepare a preservation plan. The way we do it, generally in Indianapolis, we respond to people's requests as opposed to going out there and just deciding the preservation commission can do this. So we respond to requests, we have to do that. Then the preservation commission has to hold a public hearing to which every property owner is sent a notice and they adopt the plan and recommend it to the Metropolitan Development Commission. The Metropolitan Development Commission then has to have a public hearing and everybody gets a notice. And then they approve it, it becomes part of the comprehensive plan and it's done. Property owners do not have to agree. They don't have a vote. There's no statutory input other than coming to a public hearing. That's never been good enough for the preservation because they have always wanted to have a lot of buy-in to this process. So around that very simple statutory process, they have built a complicated process <laughs> that assures neighborhood input so that the, this plan that we create isn't just the Preservation Commission's plan, but it's a collaborative effort with the community. And as you can see, it's taken everywhere from two years to 26 years to get a plan done. So some people are concerned that, oh, they're just going to come in and zap, them, zap us. <laughs> you know, that really can't happen because the commission has built in a very lengthy process that requires input and support among, uh, in the neighborhoods. I talked earlier about conservation. In the mid-90s, we decided to kind of create a little twist. 
Now, all of these 17 districts that we have are technically historic districts. Um, but I would say 12 of them are the traditional preservation strategy. Basically, we review everything that could happen on the outside of the buildings unless we, in that plan, have specifically said, we're not going to approve that. We're not going to review this or that. Conservation strategy is the flip side of that. You assume we're not going to review anything unless it's on a very specific list that we spell out in the plan. Consequently, there's less protection and the guidelines that we put in place, the design guidelines, are, are sometimes looser in, in many ways. So it's not the right strategy for every neighborhood. It's aimed more for one where uh, you have maybe the architecture isn't as high style. So we have 12 of the traditional historic districts. We have 11 individual properties where they're treated the same way. We have five conservation districts. Each one of them has their own plan with kind of a different set of what we look at in each one. Now, how do we actually protect? It's all because of the state law that gives the authority to do that. And the state law does not allow any work to go on on the outsides of these properties. But we don't regulate the interiors of people's properties. Um, no demolition, all, no alteration, reconstruction, or any of those things, uh, unless you have a certificate of progress. It also does not allow the city to grant any permits. And that's how we usually find the cases where people try to do work without approval, is they go to get a permit and they, they can't get it because they don't have this piece of paper. Now, how do we grant that certificate of appropriateness? We have three ways. Commission, they meet once a month. It's a public hearing and everybody, well, not everybody in the name, around a certain area and associations and a whole list of people get them notice of that. Um, every week in our office we have a hearing officer hearing. It's also a public hearing, but it's a lot less formal. And the commission put that into place. And, and they've given us guidance on what kinds of things we can approve, which is a lot of stuff. And that allows people to get approvals a lot quicker than having to wait every month. And then the commission's also granted us the ability to do staff approvals on things. If it's a re-roofing on your house or a new fence, chances are we're going to do it, be able to do a staff approval on that, which could be very quick. I mean, theoretically, you could come in the office and walk away with it. But I'm not going to promise it to you. might take a day or two. <laughs> Depends. So this kind of shows you the bulk of the stuff we approve are staff approvals. Hearing officer, only about 20% or less actually go to the commission. And we have, the statute tells us when we make decisions, we base it on these kinds of design. You know, not what does David Baker think is right, but these kinds of things. And the, each plan has guidance on how to meet these kind of criteria. Um, this is just, I've thrown in a couple of things. These are like stumbling blocks. Oftentimes we run up against. People get very funny about paint color. And this is the big, when people want to say, like attack historic preservation, the first thing is always the paint color. You know? Well, in reality, only half of our districts, we, in only half of them do we review paint colors. Um, personally, I'm not a big one on paint color because they can change. And they allow, this is my personal thing. Uh, they, you know, if we're gonna be telling you, directing you on how you make changes to your house and all that, um, I think it's one way for people to have their own personal expression is paint colors, and they, they're temporary. 
But a lot of the neighborhoods don't like that. They want to have some control over it. So, so we do at eight, but in no cases do we have a list of approved paint colors or anything like that. And I can guarantee you, we allow a wide range of paints. So unless you want to use fluorescent paint or something, you're probably going to get approved from this. And because we provide assistance, a lot of people are very grateful just to have us help. So we don't tell you this is how you paint your house, but we might, if asked, we might give you some suggestions. And then I always get thrown, where are you going to put the American flag? Well, I got, I won't go into details why, but I went out once and just went around and took pictures. We have flags everywhere. We don't approve those kinds of, I mean, people can do that. We're not into that. Um, there are a body of people who think they can't tear down anything, even if it's a tumble down old garage. But, but we've approved the demolition of each one of these for one reason or another. We do review it to see, because there are some garages out there that are perfectly good, and they were designed, you know, really uniquely or something that, you know, we can be careful about those, but anyway. Um, so, you've been in existence for 48 years. Uh, why does it work? Why does this whole circus vision work? I think the real reason is, is this, that it protects the investment. People sense that. Um, they sense that they're attracted to this neighborhood for some reason. And it has to do with the character, the quality of the physical aspects of that neighborhood. And they want some assurances that that's not going to completely change over time. And in older parts of the city, that can happen. So they want to know that that's, there's some control over that. Frankly, you know, there's nobody says, okay, I want somebody to have, to tell me how to do something with my property. Nobody actually wants that. But people do sort of like to know that everybody around them is having some kind of a review process. And, and obviously, you can't have one without the other. But you do have some assurances that what goes on around you, one, isn't going to radically change, and two, any changes that happen, you are going to know about them ahead of time. When you're not in a historic district, you don't really know what's happening around you until the bulldozer comes or the construction crew comes. And at that point, it's too late to try to have any input into it. Um, People ask me all the time, you know, well, is, you know, we want the historic district, we want to be a historic district because our property values are Well, I can't guarantee that at all, but I can tell you that it's been studied. In 97, a study was done here in Indianapolis with two case studies, uh, Fletcher Place and uh, Holy Rosary Gate. No. Yeah, Holy Rosary Danish Church. Okay. And he studied, he's a nationally known economist, and he studied communities throughout Indiana. This was a study done here. And it was an interesting study because these two neighborhoods are as similar as you can possibly get. Um, they're both the same distance from downtown, they both are influenced by Lily, all those things that influence how a neighborhood develops. Uh, they're both about the same size. They both were developed about the same time. They both have the same kinds of houses in them. They are both on the National Register and have been for a very long time. This one, however, has never been locally detected. This one has. What he found is that property values over time in the locally protected one rose a lot. I mean, it's good news for both neighborhoods because uh, Holy Rosary Danish Church also improved over time, but not as great. And it, so it kept up with 
that quadrant of the city, whereas this exceeded that quadrant. Um, not sure what that means exactly. Is it gentleness of uh, historic preservation protection? I don't know. But I can tell you that anyone who says that it's somehow affords development, that's not what <laughs> evidence shows. Um, another preservation benefit is um, as a real estate marketability thing. A lot of realtors will really push that. Um, I would argue that while some, you know, you might, we might disagree on how beautiful something turns out. And uh, some things I, I, that we approve, I like better than others. But all in all, I would argue that your quality of design in historic districts is higher than what happens outside of historic districts. All of these were done in National Register districts in Indianapolis, but only these two were reviewed by us. And I, I would argue that there's good contemporary architecture and not so good, and there are good ways to make additions to houses and other ways that kind of obliterate the original house. But I do recognize the beauties of the kind of the whole too. Uh, another preservation benefit is tourism. Uh, it, if you all know about the, historic, the cultural districts, when um, Indianapolis Downtown Incorporated was involved in this, and they did the cultural district for the wholesale district, they don't care about historic preservation, but somehow it sells, and somehow it attracts interest. So they went ahead and called this whole area the wholesale district, even though the real wholesale district is all this. Obviously, they don't think it's a detriment for the public to see that as a historic area. One case study here, a quick one, is wholesale district. Um, again, common thought is that you put into place some historic preservation regulations and what are you going to do? You're going to kind of hold back development, make it difficult to develop. Well, the wholesale district, I think, has a different kind of, it can show something different happening. Um, it's been protected since 1990 and I don't know how many of you remember what that area was like in 1990. It was pretty bleak. A lot of empty buildings or very underutilized buildings. So, and I did this a couple of years ago, but there are a couple of buildings who've been completely underutilized that have been converted into hotels. Uh, 272 new hotel rooms. And we're right now reviewing a new hotel to be built in the wholesale district. Um, there's new housing units, people living there in underutilized buildings. Uh, we accommodated the, uh, the field house and the Georgia Street. Those are, those are modern adaptations that are, that are in there. So now you've got, you've got all these people who are paying taxes, who are eating at the restaurants, going to the festivals, and all that. Whereas before, you just had empty buildings. Now, you you caught from my intro, from Gary's introduction of me that I have a planning background, so I am kind of looking. I look at this from a planning perspective, but you know, it's city government. What, what time is it? What? 1047. Okay. Um, so again, I think I think historic preservation is the ultimate in city planning. It's, it's really because the community uses it and they have input into it. I would like to just I'm going to skip ahead about this. When we designated the wholesale district, that building looked like that. I knew that was underneath it because I'd seen the picture. And eventually, got returned. 
old buildings get reused in historic districts. Buildings that would be torn down anywhere else get saved. Uh, new, new development, you don't think of historic districts as new development areas, but, but huge number. Right now, I think we've actually approved over 2,000 new, dwell, new dwelling units. Those are all people living in near the downtown area. Old North Side, this case study, you know where it is. It was really bleak when it was designated in 79. These are some uh, houses that the city got involved with just to kickstart it. This is interesting. In 79, these blue areas were it was studied, and those are the properties that they considered in 79 as having already been renovated in some fashion. We went back in 2010, and you add to that everything that's been renovated since then, and all the new construction that's gone in. Notice all the blank areas up there? It's almost all been filled in. These are changes to buildings since then. Property values, look at the difference over time that's happened. Lots of new construction of single family houses, something that I was told by a developer when I first came to work here would never happen. This is all new construction in, uh, in, in there. At, the, at this point, it's more now. 204 new housing units. Um, as a planner, how do you, you make your goals? Well, in 79, they found 182 houses deteriorating. In 2010, when we went back, we could only find 19 that we could consider deteriorating. And they had a goal in their plan in 1979 of uh, to increase the percentage of residentially oriented properties, to strengthen it. And they found then that only 50% actually had somebody living in the house and it was being used as a house. 90%. It worked. Anyway, that's our website. And I'm sorry I didn't leave as much time as I wanted to for questions, but have at it. Any questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I'm observing uh, all your things for communities and everything. I see nothing on there for the south side. It's all Glitcher Place, it's all these other things. Mm -hmm. I see nothing on there for the south side as far as the enforcement and things like that. Well, again, we respond to people coming to us, neighborhoods coming to us, and we just really haven't had any anybody seeking any protections in any neighborhoods, uh, really further than Fletcher Place on the south. So in the Lucas Oil Stadium area, you haven't had anything? Around there, around Lucas? That's the south side. Yeah. There's nobody that's come sought any protection there. Where is that Bay? There's that Bay Denny. Bay Denny. That they were. That's the, the south side. Yeah. Yes, exactly. There is that neighborhood where. Um, yeah. And, and they were of interest to try to. Well, there's one lady I know that was was interested in trying to get some of that uh, story. I know L. Bean was able to be successful in their lawsuit against that area, but. Um, well, but no, the, but nobody, I can just tell you, nobody's come to the Preservation Commission and tried to undertake. Okay, the reason I'm asking you when you were talking about historical things, mm -hmm. there's a neighborhood park there that we've been trying to make sure it was preserved. It's called the Bay Denny Park, yep. which is also the Michael Street Park. It's like a block and a half from Lucas Oil Stadium. Mm -hmm. and, and so you're, what you're saying that there's no one has, has contacted you regarding this area? Correct. Okay. In relation to that same, if somebody did, 
Okay. Okay. We have already joined together our community with the old South Side group, and we're working together. But I'm trying to figure. I know at one time we did come to your group to have something done about the baby in the park and where it went or where it's at I don't know I intend to find out because that is very a beautiful part of our whole community okay, well, I, I have no memory of of that and there are lots of different agencies and city government so I'm not sure exactly because we're supposed to be on the National Register okay, but National Register I don't know whether it is or not I'll find it out. doesn't provide any protection Necessarily. Okay. Thank you. In relation to that, because I, I also live in the Cape Denny area, um, <coughs> you had said, at least what I heard was, if people asked for some sort of protection, whether it be historic district or conservation, it's, it's up to the commission to decide with input from the public but there's so little left of the historic uh, there. And yet, to me, to really be a viable area, you need a mixture of the historic and new, uh, new construction. If somebody were to come and say, we'd like to have some sort of protection for the few remaining structures in this area or anywhere else in the city, is there that ability, or is it not enough property order to support this? It can all come down. I, I can't say exactly, but definitely it's a problem, the fact that there's so little, to call it a district in right. um, There may be some individual properties that have some value from an architectural sort of standpoint. Uh, but it's lost, I'm not getting into whether it's right or wrong, mm -hmm. the reality of it is that it's lost a lot of that character that it had as a community. Um, problem, one problem is going to be, if you define an area, you've got to get a reasonable amount of support from the property owners. And a lot of the property owners in an area like that probably could not be supportive because they frankly bought property to do other things so that's a stumbling block the commission doesn't isn't interested in getting into an area where you've got 90% of people who are opposed to that kind of protection 10% that are it's just going to be a disaster and it probably doesn't serve the purposes of preservation now the commission can do an individual property for somebody. If, if somebody individually wants to put that regulation on themselves. Of course, people can do that on their own individual property by putting covenants on their property too. Yes. Well, <clears throat> the problem I have with the Indianapolis Historic Preservation Commission is that there are neighborhoods that have been getting it done over the years. That is, they were well established. Now they have elderly, a lot of elderly live in these neighborhoods. And it looks like the regentrification efforts of the city and um, metropolitan development has not been in their best interest. Um, and um, you, you, you make the statement that they don't come to you and they don't tell you whether they want to be historic or not. Well, I think it should be common sense that a city should know which areas are um, are historical and should try to do what they can to appease the residents in those neighborhoods uh, so that they don't lose their identity. No one wants to have a regentrified neighborhood when you've been living here for 50 years and you've known it as a certain neighborhood. And so regentrification comes in and relabels the neighborhood, but these people have been living there and getting it done for all along. So I think there's a there's a problem with metropolitan development and there's a problem with your commission that you don't seek out those residents that 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 want to remain a historical or wants to, wants to keep their landmarks and their assets there now i saw on one of your slides where you talked about you re, um, you remodeled one of the buildings downtown the bright building i noticed 
that when it when you after you remodeled it, bright was removed from the from the top of it. To me, that's not <laughs> that's not restoring the building to you know if, if I know it as a bright building and then you remodel it and bright's removed from the top of it. To me, that's not restoration. No. First of all, the preservation commission did remodel it. We're a regulatory agency. We don't go out and buy property and remodel it and put money into property. We just provide some regulatory control. And that particular building, the name Bright and what there, that was taken off years ago by the property owner when they put that 1950s front. And when they took it off, that was long gone. It just wasn't there anymore. So it had nothing to do with the city or the Preservation Commission or anything like that. Um, regarding, I don't know what area you're talking about, but areas. People There's who several are, areas. People who are interested. The thing is, people are sometimes interested in in the uh, you know the future of their neighborhood. Everybody is. But when they really look at what's involved of, of the regulatory sort of uh, layer that gets put on the properties, not always people aren't always interested in it. But uh, you know, we can talk about particular areas. So uh, I mean, any anybody, any neighborhood group that is interested in talking with us about it is welcome to come talk to us about it. But we don't really have uh, the staff or the ability to go out there and just be trying to designate as much as we can out there. Uh, we, we just, it's the strategy, that it's, it's the way it's worked here in the Annapolis is we wait for neighborhood groups to come talk to us about it. And they come to us in various different ways. but. Um, I'm glad to talk with you about specific areas sometime if you'd like. I have a question. What office yeah. are you running for? Um, no. <laughs> are you talking about developing a plan? And, and, I'm, and, and I understand that we need to come and talk to you about creating that. Is there something on your website that talks about the steps to go through to create a plan? That say I want to protect my neighborhood, I need to figure out how to do that. I think there is, <laughs> and we're in the process right now of kind of changing that process a little bit. Um, we're changing about the way we ask neighborhoods to show us that there is neighborhood support. Um, we used to have, require a petition, not by law, but by policy. But now we're letting each neighborhood kind of decide how they want to measure their support. And we're building in more early input with the commission itself. Because frankly, we don't want to go years down the road of creating a preservation plan for an area to find out at the end that there was really only five people who were interested, and you have all these other property owners who are completely opposed. Um, and, and so that's how we try to keep that from should this woman then have 25 people come to see you or what? She has a problem in her area. How many people do you need to come in and say they need help? I just need one person to start a conversation. <laughs> okay. But, you know, protecting one park may not actually be, we may not actually be the tool if that's what somebody wants, is to protect the park. Because quite frankly, the state statute doesn't even talk about landscape. I'm not sure we have the authority to do that. That would be one issue. It, it may not be the right tool. One might argue that the state of Indiana should have a tool. That's one issue that we've had. A lot of neighborhoods want design review, but they don't necessarily want the historic district and everything that goes along with it. But the state of Indiana doesn't provide local communities with the kind of a 
authority that some states do to put in place just sort of general design review. So we are the only entity that really can do it. So we've been asked a couple times to get into the neighborhoods, only to find out that that isn't what people really want. It's, it's very complicated. What about the church down across from the football stadium? I just read where they're going to, to get rid of that church, St. John's. I you know anything about that? I don't know anything about that. They must be going to the wrong place. That's all I have. Yeah, like Speedway and Morris. Um, if, if I believe our statute, the statute, that we are the ones that would, if that somebody came to the vote, yes. But um, don't, then nobody's asked for that. We have been out in Lawrence, it's come up a couple of times, but nobody's gone forward with that. But it would be us that would 